Now that you know the long run story, we can apply that long run story to some of the things we've seen in the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model and extend the analysis a little bit. All right, so just to bring you back to the last screencast, what we learned is that in the short run will be where aggregate demand crosses short run aggregate supply. But in the long run, we're gonna wind up on this blue vertical line that now we're calling long run aggregate supply. And again, here's long run equilibrium. So let's look at the first application of this new extended model. Let's look at demand pull inflation. Just to remind you, and hopefully it's a reminder, demand pull inflation happens when there's too much spending in the economy. In other words, when aggregate demand shifts to the right. Now in the short run, we would move from point A to point B. In the short run, we'd be above full employment. Prices would go up, GDP would go up, and employment would go up. But now that you know the long run story, you know what will happen in the long run. Once resource prices like wages can adjust to what's going on, we're going to wind up back in full employment. Here the story would be that we're above full employment. There's going to be an upward pressure on resource prices like nominal wages. That's going to make it harder, more expensive to produce. And aggregate supply all by itself is going to shift to the left. So in the long run, we're going to wind up back at full employment at point C. And the moral of the story here is that you can't be above full employment forever. It's just impossible. Um, full employment is where we're going to wind up. All right, the second application would be for cost push inflation. And again, hopefully this will be a little bit of review. Starting at point A, cost push inflation happens when aggregate supply shifts to the left. Moving from point A to point B, you'll notice that prices rise and they're rising because of an aggregate supply shift to the left. We call that cost push inflation. Now this presents a little bit of a dilemma for policymakers. If we use monetary or fiscal policy to try to push aggregate demand back to the right to get to full employment, we can do that. You'll remember that fiscal and monetary policy are all about moving aggregate demand, but you'll see what the problem is. We're gonna get even more inflation. Moving from the short run, point B, pushing aggregate demand to the right would move us to point C, back to full employment, but at a cost, and that cost is even higher prices. But now there's a second option. If you believe that long run story, you might say, let's just leave this economy alone. Let's not do any fiscal or monetary policy. Because if we do that and leave the economy alone, it'll work itself out. Again, the below full employment story is that we're below full employment. There's a downward pressure on resource prices like wages that's gonna make it easier or cheaper to produce. And automatically, without any government interve intervention, aggregate supply is gonna to shift to the right. In other words, we're gonna wind up back where we started, which is preferable to using monetary or fiscal policy because we get to full employment, but we get there without even higher levels of inflation. All right, so that's the second application of this extended analysis. Finally, for the screencast, let's look at what a recession looks like, both in the short run and now in the long run. Let's suppose that uh, there has been a reduction in investment spending that causes aggregate demand to drop, throwing us into a recession. There's the recession. Moving from point A to point B, notice that we're below full employment, we have unemployment, that's what a recession looks like. Now we could use fiscal or monetary policy to try to push aggregate demand back to the right. And if we were to do that, we'd wind up where we started. Back at point A, we might call that point C now. Um, and that's pretty good, you know, we're back at full employment, um, back at full employment GDP, but there's a second option. Going back to our little recession, let's say that we don't do anything. Let's say again that we leave the economy alone. The long run story says that we should get back to full employment even without those monetary or fiscal policies. Because if we're below full employment, again, downward pressure on wages, easier or cheaper to produce, Aggregate supply all by itself without any government intervention will shift to the right and move us back. And you'll notice that this is a little bit preferable. We get back to full employment, but at even lower price levels. The, the, the dispute here is about how long this long run story takes. You know, if, if it's just a couple of days and we're stuck at point B for just a couple of days, no big deal. We'll have an unemployment for just a couple of days. But if the long run story takes years or decades, we might not want to be at point B for years or decades. That's a lot of human suffering and we might, might want to artificially uh, 
use monetary or fiscal policy to move us back to that blue vertical line as quickly as possible. And that dispute about how long the long run story takes and whether the long run story even exists and works forms a lot of the basis for the disputes between uh, that economists wind up having. There are the economists who say, hey, leave the economy alone. And there are the economists who say, no, we need the government to do something. And now you, I'm hoping that you're starting to get a sense of why it is that the, these economists feel this way. It's, it's a lot about whether this long run story is a true story and how long this long run story takes to tell. All right, so we saw three applications of the long run story, demand pull inflation, cost push inflation, and recessions. Um, and that is it for this screencast. That's not fair that I failed the test. You said that I got question one wrong. You did. The Bolshevik Revolution did not result in democracy in Russia. But a friend told me that D would be the answer. I am aware that you were trying to cheat. That is why I changed the answers before you took the test. That's not fair.